Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of CP for SA and today we'll be talking logistics with someone who's plied that trade in South Africa, Chile and knowing my guest we might even end up touching a little bit on politics. Please help me welcome Vuma. Thanks, thanks, thanks so much, Sabang. Really good to be here today. Yeah, man, it's been a while since we've been planning to, to have you on here. So Yeah, I've been planning for a very long time, so it's good to be um, sitting around the table uh, and having this chat. Um, I must say kudos to you for the work that you're doing. Definitely is something amazing. No, awesome, man. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Um, I think just to, to get us started, uh, I'm going to ask you to maybe tell us a little bit about yourself, but maybe also just get straight into... Um, logistics as a whole and what that is because I think as much as we've all heard a little bit about about logistics we're not quite uh, you know well informed on what exactly it entails. Yeah so um, basically my name is Bumang Nobo, currently working for Anglo-American uh, as a logistics specialist covering rail and port operations. Mm -hmm. um, in my lifetime I've worked with quite a number of different commodities that range from coal, platinum, um, iron ore and copper um, and obviously in the past year I've been based with um, the coal business so we've been working on quite a few different interesting projects there. Um, for me logistics is something that I'm very passionate about. It's something that I grew up around. It is basically what I say is my life story. Um, starting, you know, my father used to own a logistics company doing uh, liquid bulk logistics. Um, and from there onwards I also decided to get into that. However, it wasn't something I directly jumped into started with marketing first and found a way then to move into logistics and brought in an element of industrial engineering into that along the way. Mm -hmm. So what logistics is for me is more than what a lot of people think it is. Um, you know, when you talk about logistics, immediately people think that it's trucking. Trucks are the first thing that come to mind. But in most instances, what you find is that it's actually an element of a lot of things combined together, which can be focused around planning um, and it's looking at around delivering value through efficiency and optimization. So it's about customer service and at the same time also cost, driving costs down. Mm. How do you get products maybe say from factory to the end of the market? It can be upstream or downstream at the lowest possible cost to deliver value to the customer at the end of the day. And that's what logistics is about. When we're talking about logistics, it's not just limited to the land-based logistics. It can be seaborne logistics or airborne logistics and for different types of commodities as well that need you to be thinking about a lot of things um, along the way. So that's one interesting perspective about logistics. And again, it also covers elements of various different disciplines because, for example, depending on the product you're loading, you need to know about the properties of that product and how it reacts to different environments yeah. because then that will dictate to you how you need to load that product. Think about um, chrome, a product that has high density. Um, if you're shipping chrome, basically you're not going to find a way to keep it dry along the whole voyage yeah. so that when it leaves the port and it gets to the customer, the cargo does not get rejected because it's out of spec. Out of spec could be it's, too, it's less than what departed at the port or it's more than what departed at the port. And there's a lot of things that you just need to think about, you know, in, 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 in when it comes to logistics. So storage ability is one of those big things, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I can imagine how, how logistics in a mining context could be quite, quite complex. Because I think, like you rightfully say, uh, if you promise a certain product as you ship it out, uh, it has to be what arrives at the end. So oh, yeah. um, I think, you know, for some of the future guests we'll be having as well, uh, if you think of people that have uh, products that might react as they're on the road, that would probably be something that they need to engage yeah. with you guys um, mm. around. Uh, but I think that's that's very interesting. Um, and I think, you know, in, our, in some of our preparatory conversations, uh, you know, you spoke a bit about, um, you know, having to take into account all possible um, scenarios that could happen, you know, as and when, you know, products are being transported. Uh, so do you want to maybe run us through... Uh, some of the thinking that takes place to try and you know plan for all possible outcomes as you plan for a uh, journey of a particular product? Yeah, so I mean, I think uh, for me what I really say logistics is about the whole gist of it is planning, planning, planning at the end of the day. Um, you know, be it whether you're planning for demand from a supply chain perspective or whether you're planning for the whole voyage. 
there's a lot of things that you've got to look at along the way. Firstly, you know, you've got to look at how you package, um, how you're going to move um, this material around. You've got to look at as well as um, your damage rates as well for particular types of products and how you need to pack um, them to, you know, sort of change a lot of that uh, and make sure that it, it, it works best. I'll make an example, you know, a couple of years ago, um, I had a colleague tell me a story of while they were still working at, um, well, I won't mention the company, but basically that company wanted to change the packaging of their product. Uh, it was a juice product. And basically what they figured is that this new packaging would only be able to pack eight items into a carton mm. versus the previous packaging could pack um, 10, which means they were losing the efficiency of two bottles. So that's how it just talks about, firstly, how different types of disciplines tie in together because marketing wanted to change the product packaging, but mm. logistics was like, no, guys, you can't do that because we're losing the value. We'll be shipping less items at the same cost, which then uh, has an impact on, 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 on your efficiency um, as to how you're using and utilizing your resources. So that's the first thing. I think with logistics, more than anything, it needs you to plan um, and you know you always have to start with the end in mind. Yeah. So depending on where your product is going, you need to think about what's the type of environment that it's going into there, especially if it has to go on another land-based voyage once it arrives at the destination. If it arrives at the destination and you find that maybe it's in a container and it's got to go and it's a war zone where it is, then you've got to make the necessary security preparations for that to get it there. Another big element that will determine how much responsibility you take on again in logistics is what we refer to as INCO terms, mm -hmm. which are the international commercial terms of trade. Um, and there was an iteration in 2010 and there's new ones in 2020. And what these look at, they look at cost, um, responsibility, um, and, and, and basically those are the things that it looks like over the, over the voyage, right? And risk, cost, responsibility, and risk. So it determines who carries what um, between the seller and the buyer throughout the whole voyage. Yeah. So you've got the A terms, the D terms, the C, uh, C terms, um, F terms, and basically that's what it is. So the E terms, X works, only one, which means that the, um, uh, the, the, the seller needs to make the goods prepared at the door. That means you as the seller make the goods available, and then wherever it goes, the logistics, preparation, cost, responsibility, etc., etc., gets handled by the, um, the buyer themselves. Yeah. So that's the sort of relationship that determines who does what and what applies where, who's responsible for organizing the ship or the aircraft and all of the costs that go into that. Mm. So it, it can be very, very technical in its, in its, in its own sense. Um, but at the same time, I think more than anything, the whole gist behind it is planning more than anything. Um, that's 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 what say that they're not not just planning for per voyage rather, but yeah. planning months and months out in advance. Yeah, um, I think with the with the earlier example you used with the packaging, it it took me back to you know when when Apple first announced that they were not going to be including charges in their boxes, uh, but then when I saw the visuals of how much it was increasing the product that they were able to move. Um, mm -hmm. on the ship as a result of the box being a lot smaller yeah uh, it was you know pretty much an exponential um, growth so you could see how decisions like that had to have everyone involved including people from logistics to explain yeah. just how much more capacity you would get uh, when you did that yeah uh, yeah that's pretty cool yeah no it's, it's it's pretty cool what 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 you can do with a little bit of planning and a little bit of changing here and there yeah um i think you know to deliver value these days regardless of what industry you're in, you've got to be willing to innovate and be creative um, in the way that you do things. Yeah. Um, and that's the whole gist of it. And that's what it is at the end of the day. No, awesome, man. Awesome. Uh, but I guess to to relate this a bit to someone who might be interested in, in logistics, um, what sort of individuals, and I'm, I'm speaking both now academically and just interest-wise, what sort of individuals are suited to logistics? So I think people who are suited to logistics are people who are planners um, by nature, people who are creative um, in the ways that they look to deliver value. Because I think one of the things about logistics is that you've got to be a cowboy in some sense and look at getting value in different sorts of ways. Uh, I'll make an example, you know, um, and when you talk about value, you talk about efficiency, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and if you're loading up, um, um, basically you're maximizing um, 
or sweating your assets being your train or your ship or your aircraft or whatever it is, you deliver more efficiency out of that. Mm -hmm. So if you have a train that pulls a hundred wagons and you're able to then say that, okay, it can technically right now we're pulling a hundred wagons, but it can actually pull 104 or 106 if we max it out. Mm. Why don't we do that? And that's where you get value, right? Being creative with the asset that you have. I think in air logistics as well, one of the things that they look at as well in terms of them is it's like sweating their assets. And you look at how low cost airlines operate on a time schedule and where the plane lands, fuels up and it's got to go again. Mm. It's things like that. So you've got to look at basically redesigning the traditional models or ways of working. Mm. That's how you get um, 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 things changed and things done in logistics. So I think if you're not a conformist, um, I think logistics would be suited for you. And basically, if you have an interest and a passion for, 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 for international trade um, and, and, and international and global markets, um, then you'll have a lot to learn and a lot to do there. Yeah. Because, I mean, uh, there's so many things that tie into logistics if you think about the fluctuating exchange rates, you know, that in the, even if you look at recently the closure of the um, Suez Canal due to the ever given ship that um, closed the section of the Suez Canal and how something as small as that can have a major impact on freight rates mm. or the routes or the shipping routes as well because a lot of guys find themselves traveling around the Cape now to get to Europe just simply because of a small thing like that or mm -hmm. if you look at um, um, when you're talking about uh, global warming and the melting of the Arctic and it just shortens the trip um, you know around the globe um, maybe say from, from, from different parts of the world um, and it opens up new shipping routes and shipping lanes etc etc so it's something to think about you know whether you, where, where you don't have a closed up mindset um, and then you're not rigid I think logistics would be very suitable as a career path. Yeah, I think the, the more we talk about it, the more I see, you know, some of the practical effects of it. Uh, particularly, you know, I work in a landlocked uh, mine setup. So I can imagine that at the beginning, when this mine was being designed, you know, there had to be thoughts about, but how do we get all this product yeah. uh, to the closest, you know, port? You yeah. know, do, we, yeah. do we use trucks? Uh, do we use plane? Uh, and I think they ended up deciding on, well, not I think, but they ended up deciding on a railway line, you know, yeah, running straight yeah. across. And I can imagine, you know, the, the maths and financial thinking that was involved in, you know, coming to that uh, conclusion to say this is probably the most price efficient and most effective way to move this product. Yeah, yeah. I think you, it's, it's that efficient term, you know, I think the two keywords when you come up to logistics is efficiency yeah. and effectiveness. And efficiency is always cost, effectiveness is service. Yeah. And, um, you know, we was particularly talking about in the mind that you work in, for example, how do you get service which is meeting the market's demand? Um, and, and because you're a price taker, you meet the market's demand at any price at any given time. And then the efficiency is how do I then internally control my own cost to make sure I get the most value out. Because remember we were talking about eco, eco terms a while ago, mm. and normally what they use is an FOB term, which is free on board, and you look at that free on board price, which means it's then from the mine to the, so your cost would cover the cost maybe say, depending on the eco term applied, would be your mining and processing costs and loading it onto the train and getting it down to the port and making it available alongside the ship and loading it onto the ship. Once the cargo crosses the rails on the ship, yeah. then the ownership, I mean, in terms of the cost, risk and responsibility, then Changes. transfers over yeah. to the buyer. So so, so, so that's the, the thing for me about, about logistics. It's, it's just efficiency. They had to think about ways to do it. And what's nice about it is as well, uh, just a little bit of history about um, the line um, that, that, that we're talking about right, that right now. It's got the history consecutively of, of pulling the longest trains in the world. I think in the 1990s, they pulled a 12 kilometer train in mm. one single go. And I think about two or three years ago, they pulled an even longer train, 13, 14 kilometers. Mm. So it just shows you that there's always opportunity for maximization and also then because we're living in an ever-changing environment where you have computer processing power, technology improving at such a pace, mm. it allows you to do more and more. Um, and nobody knows where the peak is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I will say where I, I do see, and I don't know if all possible uh, options have been looked at, but where I do see a lack of uh, planning or a lack of logistics would be, I mean, I, I grew up in Limpopo. I mm. even worked in a mine in Limpopo at some stage. 
and I see how the very small roads there, including the, the N11, oh. um, you know, has all these trucks that keep going back and forth, you know, with very heavy copper on it, uh, that continuously just degrades those roads, mm. um, you know, making them very dangerous to travel on. And I always wished uh, that someone would come up with a more effective way to transport, you know, that heavy, heavy, very, uh, heavy, very heavy material, yeah. um, you know, into the country. Um, but I don't know if anyone's on it, uh, but I do hope that at some stage they come up with a solution because I think, you know, trucks in general on roads, you yeah, know, yeah. I wish we could isolate, you know, where trucks travel and where humans travel. Because uh, it always seems a bit dangerous when we engage, uh, especially at night, on some of those roads. Indeed. Um, that's one of the things I'll always uh, definitely agree with. Um, I mean, I just got back from Newcastle um, yesterday and um, looking at the road conditions there, be it the R34 or um, is it maybe traveling via the Machuba Pass and so forth, there's just, the roads are never in a great condition. Um, you know, obviously they are repaired now and then, but some are just never repaired. Yeah. Um, that's where I think that the planning perspective comes in. And I'm an advocate for rail, right? Um, especially when you're talking about dry bulk materials. Mm. Um, you know, I think the best way to move that, so the most efficient for short haul, definitely trucking, but for long haul, rail. Nothing beats rail in terms of cost. Mm -hmm. Rail and pipeline, yeah. Yeah. Rail and pipeline for liquid bulk, or if you're moving slurry materials and so forth, it is the most efficient. You can't beat it in terms yeah. of cost. Um, and, and, and I think that's the one thing. Now, the, the question then comes in is, who's investing into the infrastructure, right? And um, does the infrastructure, again, is another question that comes in, does the infrastructure have the capability to be able to handle that heavy type of material on it yeah because um it's, it's often thought that yeah because the rail is there it can move anything no there's actually a specific type of high speed rail that needs to be able to carry loaded cargo um to ensure that you reduce the risk of derailments um and continuously breaking the line but personally i'm an advocate for rail and i think with more planning particularly infrastructure planning uh, and infra infra infrastructure maintenance, you would get a lot more value and you'd save a lot more lives by getting trucks off the road. But at the same time as well, um, you know, and, and this is according to some stats I read um, a while back, is that one of the easiest industries for previously disadvantaged people to enter is transport. Um, and when you take away transport and move it to rail, which is state-owned, mm -hmm. you're sort of taking away business from generally previously disadvantaged people um, yeah. in that area and opportunities. So it's a catch-22. You've got to find the, the yeah. ground. Yeah. Look, that's, that's a conversation that I'm having more often than I would like to now, where, you know, innovation challenges, uh, you know, jobs and so on, you know, especially within the African context. Uh, we could go on for hours with that, so I won't really get into it. Uh, but I do think it's sad that we do often have to save people's jobs and not be the most effective that we could be. Yeah. Uh, but understanding that if we don't do that, then you have quite a lot of people that but I, I, are left struggling. You're 100% correct, right? And the, the, the question then comes into mind is that how do we start planning for the next generation then? Yeah. Um, to say that are we giving them the right skills, education, to be able to get to that level where they are not under threat in the future? Um, are we able to forecast and have the right type of strategic foresight um, to say that, okay, this is where the world is going, this is where the jobs are going to be impacted, this is what our demographics and statistics look like in terms of literacy, education and skills, mm -hmm. how do we match the two? That's the work and planning we should be going into at this place as a country. Yeah, and you know what? I think on that, I will probably have you back uh, just to have a conversation <laughs> on that because I think that's a 30-minute conversation on its, yeah, yeah, um, on its own. But I think you're actually giving me a perfect segue into, you know, I know that you're particularly passionate about politics. Yeah. Um, uh, so, I, yeah, I, th I think just to get a gist of it, uh, what are your thoughts on where we, we currently are as a, as a country? Yeah, so where we are as a country, I think we're at a point where nothing else will solve our problems apart from a social compact. Um, and social compact is where you get key members of society around the table 
um, and they thrash it out and come out with a plan. Um, it's worked in Rwanda, it's worked in Australia with the Australian Accord, it's worked in Ireland, mm -hmm. um, and I think that's what we need to see ourselves starting to do as a country, because unfortunately it is an opportunity that we missed uh, in 1994, um, in which I feel in 1994 all we did was put a plaster over a festering wound. Um, and all of those who were, who's, who, who were covered by that plaster, you have the next generation coming through who had absolutely nothing to do with that, but are suffering the effects of that and the lack of progress that's been made yeah. along those years. So the first thing we need to do is get a social compact going between business, labor, government and civil society when they need to sit around the table and come up with a plan, a serious plan that they're all going to commit to and commit to working towards and meeting each of their own individual targets, goals, etc, etc. That's the first thing that we need to sort out as a country in general. Um, I think the second thing again that we need to sort out then is the planning aspect. Um, so my Dr. Fugene used to say um, that as a country we've got a graveyard of brilliant plans. Um, you had gear, you had uh, R2G ready to come, you had Askisa, and now you've got the NDP. Um, and as much as people might criticize it, I think the NDP is a brilliant plan, right? Um, the only problem is implementation and execution of that. Mm -hmm. I'll give you some numbers for some context. The NDP says that they wanted to reduce unemployment from 2012 to 2020 to 14 percent and then by 2030 to six percent right that's where they wanted the employment to be mm -hmm. unemployment to be it needed to be at six percent in uh, 2030 um and so far we have gone in the opposite direction instead of decreasing unemployment we've actually increased unemployment increased public debt and there's all of these statistics and numbers that tell you that we are going in the wrong direction and will not meet those targets excuse me in order to have met those targets from 2012 to now, we needed to see at least between 5 to 6% economic growth a year on year to reach those targets, and we have not. Which then tells us that we've got a problem, a problem in implementation and, I mean, in implementation and execution. Mm -hmm. That's where the problem lies. How do you fix that? Do you start to build a more technocratic state with the right people in the right positions who are able to implement and execute at the right level that's where the thing comes in yeah so um you know before you make it to the top 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 positions in politics i think we need to start at the grassroots level where you have the highly skilled professionals in those levels and delivering in those communities municipalities first um, and judging by their performance on that level, then they can get graduated to a city level yeah. and from city level to provincial and national. Um, and, and, and that's some of the food for thought, you know, we need to start applying here and there. Yeah. Execution is everything. Yeah, look, I, I think you're, you know, you're 100% you're correct. And I think you're saying what a lot of us are always thinking is, you know, how do people earn the positions that they, they get given because you would think you need to have a proven track record of certain yeah. achievements that put you in a position where now you're expected to deliver to hundreds and millions of people. Yeah. Uh, but unfortunately, yes, I think we, we're definitely missing that. Um, but I think, you know, with time, with time in mind, um, the last thing that I want to touch on, uh, you know, to humanize you a bit as well, <laughs> is uh, I did see you and a couple of guys on SABC1 not too long ago. Um, I'll reference, you know, a link uh, to what that, that was about, but do you want to just give us a shot of what you guys were doing on that? Yeah, so these are some friends um, that I got together with um, in different phases of my life. And um, we managed to bring all these guys together um, by virtue of one thing in common, which was, um, I guess, the type of vehicle that we utilize. And um, we use that as a platform to do charity work and so forth. And um, we had an opportunity as avid travelers to sort of showcase a bit of South Africa. And um, basically what we're doing there is we're traveling around to um, Kalinan Mine and um, basically uh, exploring the area around that and what it has to offer. 
Yeah. Um, and I mean, Gauteng is a beautiful place. There's no need um, to go far um, to, 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 to enjoy a particular um, place or to go on holiday. Yeah. Um, and I think I'd like to see a lot more people just taking a drive out of town on a Sunday, going for a coffee. You know, and, and, and that's the type of thing that you get to see and learn a lot about the world out there. Um, particularly for me, one of the things I miss about my experiences abroad was the coffee culture um, and the coffee shops that they had around there. And um, honestly, I, I always find it's in these small towns on the outskirts of Joburg where you find these amazing um, coffee shops that sell, you know, some great pastries and things like that. So yeah. just travel around for things. That's, 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 that's what I was <laughs> doing on the show, yeah. No, perfect. Uh, I will say this is the second guest we've had, the second BMW driver <laughs> who uses that vehicle to, you know, to do outreaches. Uh, I don't know if it's like an attempt for you guys to make up for not indicating on roads. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> it has to be, it has to be. It no, is. I'm fully supportive. I think whatever vehicle you have, uh, and by vehicle I'm not talking cars now, mm. I just mean vehicles and skills, mm. uh, assets, whatever it is you have, it's really good to be able to use them to impact yeah. You know, people positively. Yeah. Um, yeah. Look, look. I think the onus is on us, um, and it's our duty. Uh, how we always put it with, with the guys is, is uh, we use the term We are growing each other in our circle, um, but in addition to that, also Sakisi is we're building a nation, right? Yeah. And um, you know, the onus is on us to be building the next generation. No, Vuma, I I really appreciate you joining us today. Uh, and of course, I appreciate you at home for taking the time to watch this. Uh, of course, if you like it, uh, you know, like it, uh, you know, with the actual button. Uh, leave a comment there as well. If you, as well as if you have any questions, just put them in there. Uh, and of course, subscribe to see more videos in future. Vuma, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Cheers. <laughs>